Church, you may be seated. Praise God. Praise God. Jesus is king. Amen? Amen. Amen. No matter what's going on in the world, Jesus is king. The, the love of God, the character of God, the character of Jesus, of the Holy Ghost. You should have such an understanding and such a deep connection to him that you are captivated by his every word. Captivated by his every desire. What we're talking about today is being captivated by something. And the title of today's sermon is, Are You Captivated? Now, captivated means having one interest or attention held or captured by something or someone. When you are captivated by something, that thing, whatever it may be, good or bad, has your attention, has your complete and total attention. Just like a speaker can go up to in front, of, in front of a many, many people and captivate an audience. It's because of his presentation, because of the way he's carrying himself, or because of the way he's speaking. But there are many things in this world that can captivate you. Now, we're going to talk about that today. We're going to get real deep into the things in this world that can captivate you. Because it basically comes down to two options. Either you can be captivated by God, by his word, by his kingdom, or by everything else. And everything in God's kingdom is faith, is love, joy, peace, restoration. Everything outside of him is the opposite of all that. So we're going to talk about the things that get you captivated. Now, the root word of captivated is captive. Captive. Now, what does captive mean? It means to be taken and held as a prisoner or a prisoner of war. That's what it means to be captive. It's kept within a certain bound. You are confined, captivated, dominated, or controlled dominated or controlled so something that has you captivated has you dominated or controlled for that period of time for that period of time however long that time is it also says that you are held under control of another held under control of another but having the appearance of independence isn't that interesting if you are captivated by something you are under, under the control, under the very strong influence of that thing. And it says that you have the appearance of independence. But the truth is, you're not. The truth is, you are owned and controlled by that thing that has you captivated, good or bad. You are owned and controlled by that thing that has you captivated. And it also says that it put, to be captivated puts you in a situation that makes free choice or departure from that situation, difficult. That's what it means to be held captive. And if you are captivated by something, you are held captive. You are temporarily a prisoner and a servant of whatever that thing is that has you captivated. So here's the question, church. Do you want to be captivated by God, by His Word, by everything that is good, or do you want to be captivated by the world? We know what the world gives. We know what the world produces. We can see it all around us. Chaos, destruction, nothing, everything that God hates. So we can either be captivated by the world or we can be captivated by the blood of Jesus. So what exactly is it that gets captivated? I mean, we're in this world, but we're not of the world, right? That's what the Bible says. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. So since we're in this world, we're a spiritual being living a physical experience. But the Spirit rules over the flesh, or at least it should, the Spirit of God. So what is it in this world that captivates us? Well, think about this. How do we communicate with the world? How do we connect? Our five senses. Our five senses, okay? Specifically, the sensory organs tied to our five senses. Our ears, eyes, nose, touch, our tongue, all that stuff can be captivated for good or for evil. So our five senses is what we use to connect and process information, our five senses, right? And they can be used for God's glory or they can be used for the work of Satan. Now let's get into this. So the spirit of the world can be a snare to the desires of the flesh. The spirit of the world is everything that opposes God, everything opposite of what the Bible says. That's the spirit of the world. And it can easily captivate your five senses. The enemy can come and take all of you if you let him. But we should be giving ourselves all to God. We should be able to pick up our cross daily and follow him. That means we deny our own desires for the will of God. 
And God says, if you do this, seek ye first the kingdom of God, which means to deny yourself. He says, I'll be the one who will provide everything for you. I'll be your provider. You need this, I'll give it to you. But if you stay connected to the world, you're going to provide for yourself, and you're just not as good of a provider as God is. And we want God to be our provider. Amen? Amen? Yeah. So it means we have to let him provide for us. So the spirit of the world can't do this. And if your senses are captivated by the spirit of the world, then the spirit of the world is your provider. So what about the spirit of God? Well, the spirit of God, he calls, the Holy Spirit, calls our attention to the blood of Jesus, to the salvation message, to this gospel. And when our attention is called there instead, when we're captivated by that, then what's produced? Life. Life. But if you're captivated by the spirit of the world, that's the deeds of the flesh. And all that produces is death. That's all that produces. Now, Paul talks about this very, very often through the gospel. And he gives a very good contrast of one versus the other in Galatians 5.16. He goes, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit, seek after the things of God, desire the things of God, and you will not fulfill the other guy's request. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. So we know that the Spirit of God and our, our flesh, the unrenewed portion of us, they're always in battle. Okay, Your flesh wants to do what your flesh wants to do, but the Spirit of God is saying no. And then the Spirit of God wants to do what the Spirit of God wants to do, and then your flesh is saying no. Just like the battle, like, oh, did we go to church today? Did we not go? Oh, maybe we should and maybe we should. That's what he's talking about right here. That's a battle right there. Because you know God wants you in church. You know God wants you to receive the word. But only your flesh would try to talk you out of it. And who do you think's over your flesh? If it's not the Spirit of God, who is it? The other guy. This fallen world, sin in the flesh. So we must always keep our flesh in check for that reason. Because if not, then we'll be flesh dominated and we're more likely to do the things that Satan wants us to do versus the thing that God wants us to do. So he goes, I say then, walk in the spirit and you want to fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are in opposition one to another so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the spirit, then you are not under the law. You're under the spirit of grace. You have love, peace, joy, restoration, everything in him. But if you're operating under the law without Jesus, then you are subject to this world. And you're not operating in the spirit of life. So Paul says that you can use your senses to walk in the spirit or live in sin. That is a choice, church, that we make every single day of our lives. Sometimes moment to moment, we have a choice to walk in the spirit or to live in sin. And Paul goes on to explain how our senses can actually be perverted by Satan. Now let's look at Galatians 5.19, because we talked about the deeds of the flesh, right? Well, these are the deeds of the flesh. These are the things Satan wants you to do. In 5.19, it says, Now the works of the flesh are these. The desires of Satan are these. Adultery, sexual morality, impurity, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, rage, selfishness, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, carousing, and the like. And I warn you, as I previously warned you, that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. All the stuff that you see going on in the world today, all the perversions, all different forms, even unforgiveness, this is all the desire of the enemy, guys. God, God does not want you to live this kind of life, but the devil does. Why? Because if he can pervert your senses, then you'll never get to use them to glorify God. And you'll get stuck where you're at. And then you'll be, I guess, well, I guess what do they call it? Um, a whipping post. You'll be a whipping post for the enemy. Nobody wants to be a whipping post. It doesn't feel good. People have had that experience in their life being a whipping post, being used by somebody else. So we know what that doesn't feel like. But spiritually, it'll destroy you. So it's so very important that we understand what he's talking about. The deeds of the flesh, they're active, okay? They're active when you give in to the temptation. They're active because of the perversion of your senses. So whenever you give your senses over to the enemy, then he will destroy them and destroy you through them and other people. But what happens if we use our senses for God's glory? What happens on the other side of that coin when we resist the devil? Because the Bible says if you resist him, he will flee, right? So if we resist him, then what do we produce? We're not producing death. We're going to produce life, right? So this is what happens when you let your senses 
and you yield them to God, when you get your senses and yield them to God, this is what happens. Next verse, Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. Peace is, you can't buy peace. Patience, gentleness, goodness, faith. Faith. Imagine that. When you resist the devil, you produce faith in your life because you're trusting God. Meekness, which is gentleness. A self-control, which is a sound mind. And he says, against such there is no law. There is not a law in existence that God has, that has written that will oppose this. Oppose this fruit in your life. That means you can produce it unlimited. You can produce unlimited faith, unlimited goodness, unlimited gentleness, unlimited patience, peace, love, joy. Don't you want an unlimited, an abundant supply of those things? Of course we do, because they're good. But if you let your snares get captured by the world, the chances are you're not going to be able to produce much of this, or maybe not any at all. So those who are Christ, those who belong to Jesus, have crucified the deeds of the flesh with its passions and its lusts. So if we live in the Spirit and chase after the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Meaning, if you're walking in the Spirit, you're producing fruit for God. You're producing the kind of fruit He's talking about right here. You're producing love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith. You're producing all these things if you're living of this gospel. Whatever your source is. You, everybody's heard you are what you eat, right? Well, this, it, that applies for all your senses. All your senses have the ability to, to eat. In other words, to receive. Okay? All your senses are able to receive. So you will end up becoming whatever it is you receive the most. So if your source of what you receive is eight hours a day of just horrible television programming, you're going to become whatever you're seeing. You will become whatever you see. But if you set God before you, guess what you become? You become more Godlike. More like Jesus, which is what we're supposed to do, which is what this ministry does, turns people into Jesus. Because Jesus is the one who lives in you. Paul said, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Why do you think he was able to say that? He's basically saying, hey, you know what? I'm just a Paul suit, but Jesus, he's the one who really living in me. Jesus commands my very fingers, my eyeballs, tells them where to look, tells me what to think, what to feel. Jesus is in me because I've yielded myself over to him completely. That's why Paul can say he lives through me, meaning Jesus has his way in Paul. Jesus gets to do whatever he wants with Paul, and Paul is obedient. Why? Because he's crucified the deeds of the flesh. He no longer yields himself to the things of the world. He yields himself completely and totally to God. So what happens when a person continues in their sin and they don't crucify the deeds of their flesh and they don't produce the fruit of the Spirit? What happens? Look at Ephesians 4.17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, to walk like unbelievers in the vanity of their minds, chasing their own desires, having the under because they have their understanding darkened, and they're being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. Because of what? Because of the blindness of their hearts. Why are they blind in their hearts? Why are they ignorant? Why do they have vanity in their minds? Why are they being alienated, meaning separated from the life of God? Why? Paul tells us right here in, in verse 19, because they have sinned so much, they are now past feeling. They are now past remorse. They, not, they no longer have guilt for committing sin. They no longer have guilt or condemnation for living a life of sin. That's what this means. Being past feeling, they have given themselves over to lasciviousness, to work all uncleanliness with greediness. With greediness. You know what he means right there? He's saying they've sinned so much that their hearts, their eyes, their callous have become completely, their hearts, all their senses have become callous to God. Their hearts have become so hardened to God that they can sin and not even think twice about it. And it says here they sin with greediness, meaning they love to sin. They crave to sin. They look for sin. They make their whole life about sin. That's what it means to do lasciviousness, which is all works of sin with greediness, meaning they desire these things above the things of God. And that's dangerous. Because that's what happens when you continue your life of sin. Your heart becomes hardened a little more and a little more and a little more to the point where a year ago you would feel guilty about committing a certain sin. And a year later, you do that sin and don't even think twice about it. That's what happens when you continue in sin. Your heart becomes hardened over time. 
and over time to the point where you could possibly end up rejecting God. If there was any possibility for a person to lose their salvation once they're saved, it would be because you rejected God. And that's the danger of continuing in sin. Yeah, sure, we have grace. Sure, we're forgiven. Of course we are. But what happens when you sin to the point that you end up rejecting God because your heart is so hardened? What happens then? If there was an opportunity for you to lose your salvation, it would be there. Sin is dangerous. It is a fire that you don't want to play with. It will harden your heart to the things of God, and we cannot tolerate it at all. We cannot tolerate it at all. Unrepentant sin will darken your understanding and harden your heart to God. What does it mean to have your, dark, your, your understanding darkened? That means you're dumb concerning the things of God. You have no idea what's going on concerning the things of God. You don't think like God. You don't think like Christ. You don't crave the things of Christ. The thoughts and the mind of Christ, which is in this word of God, does not come across your mind anymore. You think the things of the world. So your senses, your mind is darkened to the things of God concerning the mind of Christ. So you don't think like Jesus anymore. You think, I want to destroy instead of, I want to lift up. I want to exalt. I want to uh, help people. You're thinking the complete opposite now because your mind will be darkened to those things of God and your understanding will be completely changed. And at that point, you end up in false doctrine. So being past feelings means you are completely callous to holiness and you can sin without any remorse at all. Basically, it would be equivalent to me going out and, I don't know, going on a murdering spree. If I go into a nursing home, shoot a whole bunch of old people up, I can go home and eat dinner and have time with my family, not even think twice about it. It doesn't bother me a bit. I can go to bed and sleep just fine. That would be what he's talking about, having your heart calloused, that you can do the most heinous sins and not break a sweat, not even think twice about it, not feel bad at all, but still go to church on Sunday and praise God. There are Christians like that, believe it or not. Their hearts are dead to God. They're dead to this gospel. They're, they're dead to the voice of the Holy Ghost and don't hear Him anymore. And they're just living a life of sin, thinking they're sin, thinking they're saved, and maybe they are, maybe they're not. But according to this gospel, you can end up rejecting Him by continuing in sin. Now I'm going to show you a perfect example of this. A perfect example in the category of our sins. And the first one we're going to look at is our eyes. Let's look at our eyes. Psalms 101 says, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. Now, this is very broad. There could be a lot of things that count as wicked, okay? Other than the obvious stuff like pornographic images, uh, watching movies that are all about violence and stuff like that, even more than that. Anything that is a temptation to your eyes to cause you to fall into sin can be a wicked thing. Like if you're a person who is an alcoholic, right? And you can't, and a commercial comes on for Budweiser. That to you would be a wicked thing, even though in the normal, it's not a wicked thing to somebody else. But to you, because you used to be trapped there, that could be a wicked thing to you. So you would continue to tempt yourself by allowing yourself to view those things. So to you, that thing would be wicked because it, it took you through bondage and Jesus delivered you out of it. Now, whatever captivates your eyes and desires, you become, okay? So focusing on something that plants seeds in your mind and your heart, that's what happens when something has you captivated with your eyes. Whenever your eyes are captivated, you're focusing on that one thing, and that one thing will plant seeds in you. It will plant seeds in your mind, and it will plant seeds in your heart. And what, continue, what happens when you continue to water those seeds? They grow roots, and they end up growing a fruit. So you end up becoming the thing you're watching the most with your eyes, okay? So whatever captivates your eyes has your desire, has your desires, and you become those desires. Now, let's look at an example of this. In Samuel 2 and 11, Samuel, 2 Samuel 11 and 12, And it came to pass in the evening that David arose off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. This is King David, okay? And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. We've heard this before. Who was this woman? Bathsheba. Look at the next verse. And David sent and inquired after the woman, sent one of his servants, and said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he laid with her. So what happened? Well, he took another man's wife. Why? Because he was looking upon her. At any point in time on that roof, he could have turned away. 
But you know, on the other side of the coin, what is this woman doing bathing on the roof in the evening? She must have known that people, she's got to know that people are out there on the evening on the roofs, hanging out. Why? Because it's beautiful, watching the sunset. It feels good. So the enemy, in my, this is my opinion, was probably telling her, hey, you want a good time for a bath. And the enemy on the other side, hey, King David, why don't you go out to the roof? I've got something for you to see. That's how the enemy works, for your destruction. And I think that's what happened with David. But it caused him to sin. Why? Because he said something wicked before his eyes. He could at any point turned away, but he didn't. So what happened? David had, she got pregnant, right? So David had her what? Her husband killed. David had her husband killed, sent him into battle. At first, David tried to get Uriah, hey, won't you come home, you know, go lay with your wife, you know. And basically, Uriah said, I can't do that, man. All my, all my fellow people are at war out there. If my, my soldiers that are with me, they're sleeping out in the fields, I'm going to sleep out in the field with them. He was a very honorable man. And David was trying to get him to go and lay with his wife the way he could blame the pregnancy on him. And nobody would find out that it was he that got her pregnant. But he didn't do that. He wanted to be with the men, with the soldiers. And so finally, David had to send him out to battle. To the front lines, the most dangerous parts where most people get killed, David had him sent out there. And what happened? He died. Isn't that evil? Isn't that wicked? A woman's husband was killed because the guy impregnated the woman, caused her to be in a relationship that was ungodly. But all because David set his eyes upon something wicked. And instead of rebuking the sins of his flesh or the desires of his flesh, he embraced it. And look what happened. A person lost their life. That's horrible. Why? Because it all started with something as little as looking. You've always heard people say, oh, well, you can look, you can't touch. Nope, that's not true. You can't look. Because you will touch. That's what happens if you continue to feed that sin, specifically with your eyes. And that's what happened with David. Now, if you know anything about David, God would say, you know, David's a man after my own heart. I'm like, wow, look at this. That just shows you the extent of God's mercy and grace. That even David was still pleasing in the eyes of God, even after falling that hard and doing something so horrible. So what happened? Nathan the, Nathan the prophet called him out. Remember that? What did Nathan do? He went up to David and told him a story. And, a, and in the story, it was a story about a, a person who did something similar that David did. And David was outraged. As where did this man you know, kill this man? How could he do this to this other poor person? And then the prophet Nathan said, that's you I'm talking about. You're the one who did that to this poor person. And then David repented. And, and the Lord told Nathan, he said, your son that is born, your child's going to die because you've done this thing. And so, just like God said, the child died. And then David got up and went on with his life. Then he married, married her, made it right. And then he had who? Solomon, who God loved. But do you see the, both sides of that coin? And my point is this, guys. Is it even when you mess up, even when you, you, you miss it so bad, God can still restore. God can still use you. So don't be condemned because you have done something in your life that is heinous or horrible. Just know that David did the same thing and God was still able to use David because he repented. He repented, said, God, I'm sorry. I missed it up. I'll get it better next time. And then he went on. And what happened? God restored him. So don't ever get into condemnation. I don't know the, I know the message that we preach here, they're, they're very, they're very, I guess some people would call them harsh. They're very, they're real. Okay, I don't fluff them up at all. It is what it is. This is the gospel, right? And y'all know that from being here for a while now that I don't sugarcoat anything. But it's for your benefit because that's the real gospel. But at the same time, you must never fall into condemnation because God always restores. He always forgives. He always has mercy. He, it doesn't matter how bad you miss it up, church. He can still fix it. If you let him. If you let him. Amen? Amen. All right. So let's look at the next category. Let's do ears. How are our ears going to get us in trouble? Well, if they look like this, you're going to get a lot of trouble, right? Why? Because you can't go out on a windy day. Always falling over. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I just wanted to laugh. Everybody's so stone cold faced right here. You know, so <laughs> let's look at Colossians 2.8. Beware, lest any man spoil you through vain philosophy, or through philosophy and vain deceit. Philosophy comes from man, okay? And after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. What is he talking about here? He's saying that a person 
through their own philosophy, through their own knowledge, through their own wisdom, can spoil you, can ruin what you believe about God. Because it's made after the tradition of men and not and after the rudiments, the, the roots of the world, okay? And it's not made after Christ. So if a man in all his infinite wisdom is teaching a person, hey, you know what? The scripture's wrong, I'm right. Listen to me, don't listen to God. That's basically what's happening. So that deception that the enemy plants in that person who's sharing whatever information with you can ruin your outlook on this gospel. It can ruin your perception of who God is and how he operates. In other words, it can get you trapped in false doctrine. So wrong teaching can lead you into deep, deep sin, or it can lead you straight to hell if you're not saved. This is exactly, this is exactly what happened to the Galatians. Look at uh, Galatians 1.6. He says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Who are they removed from? They're removed from God. They're removed from the Holy Ghost. They're removed from Jesus. This gospel that they just received in truth walked in miracle signs and wonders. Paul's saying, I'm absolutely amazed that yesterday you were producing the fruit of the Spirit, walking in Christ, living in the Spirit, and today you're chasing false idols. What is the deal? That's why Paul was writing this letter. He says, which is not another, but there are some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So he's specifically saying that there's people out to pervert the gospel of Christ, to take this message that I'm preaching and mess it up. Who do you think would do something like that? Satan. He can get a hold of a minister who's trapped in error and cause that minister to mess up everybody. That's why I'm always telling you guys, don't believe what I'm saying Take it home and study it for yourself. Because if I'm ever in an error up here, it's because I don't know I'm in an error, especially if I keep teaching it. So I have to rely on my congregation to keep me sharp. And if there's something my congregation does not agree with, then that's why the door is open and say, hey, pastor, there's something you taught. I don't 100% agree with it. Let's talk about it. And what do we do at that point? We get the scriptures for what we believe and we lay it all out. And then we look at it and we compare notes and we hash it out in the spirit. So what are we doing? We're sharpening each other. Because at the end of our meeting, we're going to have the truth, whether it's that person's view or my view, but we will have the truth and we will agree on it. And that's how we come together in one accord. That's how we agree on the Word of God. And when you do that and you grow that way in a church, it makes you stronger as the body of Christ. There's a lot of pastors that don't accept that criticism. They're like, who are you? You can't correct me. You can't tell me what to do. Man, they're already in error if they think like that. And I guarantee you, they already got some messed up doctrines, if that's the way they're thinking. Being in the position that I am, even being a Christian, you have to be open to constructive criticism. You can't be so prideful that you can't accept correction. Okay, so we must always be meek and merciful and tenderhearted, so quick to hear and slow to speak when it comes to edification of this gospel. Okay, amen? amen. All right, so we are seeing a great perversion in the gospel today, right? I'll look at all over the world, look at all these false gospels that are going around building, uh, believing in a wrong Jesus. So people want a, tur a church that teach, teaches what they hear, basically, is what I'm saying. They all have the itching ears. People want to go to a church that makes them feel good, that doesn't hold them responsible for the gospel. That's what people, unfortunately, are looking for today. They don't want to hear the truth. And where do we see that at? Look at 2 Timothy 4.3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Who's they? The body of Christ. Anybody at that, at that point. They want to endure sound doctrine, meaning they were listening to doctrine before. But after their own lusts, they will heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. But they'll be so committed to their sin that they will find a teacher, a Bible teacher, who agrees with their sin. Tells them that their sin is okay. And I'll give you a perfect example of that today is the LGBT. There are Christians who are in the LGBT that are completely convinced that it's okay to live a homosexual life. They're completely convinced of it. And I've met people like this, and they're wonderful people. They're just beautiful, wonderful people, and I love them. But their understanding has been darkened. They have been fooled by the enemy. They're still people that are still worthy of our love. They still deserve our love, and we should always treat them like that. We should never beat down on them because of their sin. We should never beat down on somebody because they sin differently than I do. Because everybody sins. But when a person has given themselves over to sins, they, they are lost. They need help. They need redemption. They need to be pulled out of that. So instead of Christians going and hating, hating on uh, the people who live that lifestyle, the LGBTQ, or however it is, I'm sorry, 
instead of letting them live that life and excommunicating them, saying, you're wrong, get out of here, you're filthy, Christians should go and love them to the best of their ability and try to pull the burning brands out of that fire and deliver them. Because there's people who are stuck in that lifestyle. They believe they're right with God. They really believe they're right with God. And that's, that's sad because it breaks God's heart that they're justifying staying in sin in their lives when they could truly be free. And, sin, and when, since there's always a repercussion for sin, I guarantee you in that person's life, there's something wrong either with their health or something else. Many of them end up being in great depression. One partner will be depressed and the other pers- person will be angry or will be sick. Something will always happen because sin does not, sin always has an effect on your physical body. And if you're living in it, you end up suffering for it. Now, I don't know why I got into that. I guess somebody needs to hear that. But praise God that we have Christians in the world today that can still reach out to everybody in love and not judge, but instead pull them in to the truth. Amen? It says that they, the time will come where they're, they're not going to want to hear the truth, but after their own desires, they'll find teachers that agree with their sinful desires because those people have itching ears, so they'll find itching ears preachers. And those people will turn away their ears from the truth and they will be turned unto fables, which is lies. Meaning they'll believe the lie and they won't believe the truth. Isn't that crazy? So that's what the ear is all about. Okay? A little bit more than going out on a windy day if you have big ears. You should have big spiritual ears so you can hear the word of God. So what's next? What about the nose? How can the nose get you in trouble? The nose is actually pretty unique. It's pretty unique. It's a special one because it has more than one meaning. Okay. In dreams and visions, um, a nose represents discernment. Like if you had a dream about something, and in the dream you couldn't smell. Like say you were in a situation with somebody in this dream, and you were in an altercation, you were arguing with somebody, and somebody you knew, you are arguing about something, but in your dream you noticed that you had a stuffy nose, and you couldn't smell. What God is telling you is you're not, you're not picking up what I'm putting down. He says you're not able to discern what's going on in that dream. Right now the enemy has your nose clogged, and you're not able to discern the truth out of this altercation. God says, I have something better for you, a way out of this situation you're in with this person, but right now your nose is clogged, so you're not able to receive what I'm trying to tell you. So in the spiritual, that's what the nose represents. It represents discernment, spiritual discernment, knowing about things at the spirit level and how to fix them. So if you ever have a dream about having a cloggy nose, that means whatever that situation is, you need to seek God for discernment. Say, said, Lord, please make sense out of what's going on because right now my discernment's off and pray, you know. But in the physical, the nose is actually tied to multiple sensory organs. Your nose affects a lot, in other words. It aids discerning the physical world around us. In the natural, the nose is closely associated with influence in what? Appetite. Taste, appetite. Now, what does the Bible have to say about the appetite? Well, let's look. Philippians 3.18 For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross. So there's people who are purposely walking to destroy this gospel by teaching false gospels, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. Whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Now, remember I told you the nose is responsible. It has a dual purpose. Now, what he's talking about right here, he says their belly is their God. Now, that could mean spiritually they want to feed themselves whatever they want to feed themselves. Their belly tells them what to do. Okay? But in the physical, it could represent a person trapped by overeating, by gluttony. It could be it's both spiritual and it's physical. Everything that happens in the spirit guides will always manifest in the physical in one way or another. So it affects the person's appetite. So the person's appetite, they, they obey their appetite instead of obeying God. You get what I'm saying? They obey their appetite. They obey the desires of the flesh instead of obeying God. And if their desires of the flesh are evil, which is what the Bible says, then guess what? They're giving themselves over to evil. They're giving their nose, their discernment over to evil. So that means that that person, because their, their judgment is clouded, they're always going to miss what God has. They're never going to quite get it right. They're always going to be way far behind or the enemy will completely be able to reroute them completely away from the truth. Why? Because they're obeying their appetite, which is directly affected by your nose, your discernment, both spiritual and physical. 
So one of the things Paul is speaking about here is, is definitely gluttony. Okay? There's spiritual gluttony and there's physical, physical gluttony. But, you know, I want to point something out before I go on from the scripture. In verse 19, it says, These people's end is destruction because their belly is their God. They obey their lusts. Okay? And they glory in their shame, meaning they're proud to be sinners. They're proud to be stuck in that sin. Who or what group can you say automatically comes to your heart and to your mind when you talk about pride? The LGBT, gay pride, pride month, all this stuff that we just endured. They're, pr they're proud of their, prideful of their sin. Isn't that what the scripture's talking about? And what does it say up here? That their end is destruction. So I don't know how you can be a Christian listening to me right now and say that it's okay to be trapped in a homosexual relationship when Paul is telling you the end of, your end is going to be destruction. Destruction of your flesh. Destruction of your soul if you're not really saved, if you believe in a false Jesus. So let's look at this. What does it mean to be a glutton? Look at Strong's Concordance. It means to be loose morally, to be morally loose, to be worthless, a riotous eater. If you're worthless, what does that mean? That means you're putting value in yourself and in the world's standards and not in God because God is the one who makes you worth dying for. Jesus' blood is the one that makes you worthy and righteous before God. So these people who are gluttons do not have their status in Jesus. They don't have the righteousness set in Jesus. They have the righteousness set in their own desires. And the righteousness of man is filthy rags like the Bible says. So these people who are gluttons, have given themselves over in that particular area to the enemy. So in that enemy, in that area, they're not worthy. Why? Because they're not gleaning from the life of Christ. They're gleaning from the death of the world. Now, the olfactory nerve can cause a person, which is your smell, to lust after food, right? But why is this dangerous? Let's, let's look at the natural. Okay, because a lot of times people don't pick up on the spiritual portion of everything, but let's, let's break this down to the natural. So how can your nose legitimately, how can your nose get you in trouble? And just the natural, your smell, smelling something. How can smelling something get you in trouble? Can you think of anything? How can smelling something get you in trouble? Well, let's look at the perfect example of this. And Jacob and Esau, in Genesis 25. Now Jacob and Esau, they're twin brothers, okay? Now Jacob was the cook, and Esau was the hunter and the gatherer. Okay, and I'm just kind of setting it up for you. Now, Jacob cooked the stew and Esau came in from the field and he was famished. He was starving. So Esau said to Jacob, please feed me some of that red stew for I am famished. And therefore his name was called Edom because out of Esau came Edomites. I think that's how you say it, Edomites. Now let's keep reading. Then Jacob said this. See, Jacob was sneaky. Okay, Jacob wasn't the first ball, firstborn. He came out a second after his brother did and he wanted the throne. He wanted the power. He wanted the inheritance for himself. So he always had it set up in his heart to some way trick his brother to hand over the birthright. Okay, so look what he said. Then Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. Sell me your birthright. Esau said, look, I'm about to die. What use is, is it to me to have my birthright? So then Jacob said, swear to me this day. And so he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. So he gave up his inheritance from his father for food because he was that hungry because the God of him, of his world was his appetite, was his stomach, was his nose, was his senses and his senses overwhelmed him to the point where he made a horrible decision and sold his birthright and all the inheritance that rightly belonged to him, sold it to his little brother for some lentil soup. Look at this next verse. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and arose and went his way. Then Esau despised his birthright all for food. Can you imagine that? It's like, ah. it's like Jesus come and knock on your door. He said, hey, man, I want to spend some time with you. You're like, oh, my God, it's Jesus. And, and you go, uh, I can't go. There's, there's my favorite crime shows on right now. Can you, can you come back later? I got to go. Boom, shut the door in Jesus just so you can go and watch that show. Can you imagine how much of a slap in the face that was? That he gave up his birthright for food because he was that overwhelmed by his senses? So you can tell that that man, he always lived by his flesh when it came to food. He was a glutton. And that's what it produced. That gluttony caused him to hand over his birthright. 
He had a great inheritance. Now, what was the end result of that? Do you think God had a problem with that? Or God, do you think God said, oh, hey, man, that's between you and your dad. You gave your birth that for a bowl of soup. Or do you think God was upset? I guarantee you God was upset. In Malachi 1 and 3 and Romans 9 and 13, it says this, As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. God hated Esau for what he did, giving up his birthright like that. How many Christians give up the rights to the kingdom, the power, and the glory every single day of their lives when they choose sin and not choose God? Because that's essentially what you're doing. You're giving it up so you can indulge in your flesh. Thank God God is merciful. Thank Him that He is merciful because we need His mercy every day, every single day. Do y'all know that story? Yep. I haven't heard that one in a while, but sure, it makes me hungry. I wish I had some lentil soup. <laughs> but praise God that He's merciful, man. See, this, this dispensation we live in now, church, where I'm so thankful that Jesus did what He did because when we mess up, He's right there to pick us up right there ready to restore us. All we have to do is repent and say, God, I'm sorry, I missed it. And we're back on track again. He's like, what are you talking about? I don't even know you did anything wrong because you're covered by the blood. And that's how we're supposed to use grace, not as an excuse to stay in the sin, but the power to get out of it because the goodness of God leads us to repent, mercy and grace and compassion. Uh, when we see how much God loves us, you don't want to stay in sin is what I'm trying to say. When you realize how much he loves you, how much mercy he extends to you, you don't want to stay in that sin. Because if you want to stay in that sin, chances are you're not even saved. Because the Holy Spirit is what convicts you to chase after God. And the Holy Spirit's not convicting your heart. You may not have him. Or maybe your heart is so dull you've completely shut him out. And that's dangerous. That's dangerous. All right, let's go on to the next one. The tongue. So the tongue is typically used for what? Tasting stuff, right? That works in conjunction with your nose. Because if you don't have good discernment, things don't taste so well. Doesn't that make sense? If, you can't, if your nose is clogged up, you can't even taste the food. You can't even taste what's going on. Now remember, these organs are how we perceive the things in the world. So in the spirit, if you have no spiritual direction, no spiritual discernment, the fruit that you're going to get from that is not going to taste very good in your mouth. So if you don't have no spiritual discernment, you're going to produce bad fruit in your life. And you're going to have to eat that fruit. Because that's the law of reaping and sowing. Do you see how those two work together? Man, I can go off on a whole other subject right here right now the law of reaping and so on, and how your nose and your tongue work together. But we're going to stay on track with today. So, it's typically used for taste, but more commonly used for what? For what? Doing what I'm doing up here, which is talking, speaking, preaching, right? So what does the Bible say about the sensory organ, your tongue? Let's look at Proverbs 18.20. Everybody knows this one. A man's belly will be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. How do you produce fruit? You, you plant a seed, you water the seed, the seed grows up, produces a fruit, right? And it says this, With the increase of his lips shall he be filled. So we know that immediately after Proverbs 18 and 20, he's talking about your tongue producing a fruit because your tongue plants a seed and produces a fruit. And then it says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. All he's saying is that per people who love to talk, whatever it is they're speaking the most is the fruit they're going to reap, and it could be death or it could be life. So if you have something to say, it might as well be about God. It might as well be about this gospel. But then, at the same time, you have to know when to be silent. Because in the multitude of, word, of words, sin will abound. And that comes from Proverbs as well, too, I believe. So we have a choice. We can either speak life or death. And that's directly tied to the sensory organ called the tongue. Now, we've done teachings about this, okay, before. And you all know all about this in this church. We're big on watching our confessions. Okay, because you have the ability to speak life or you have the ability to speak death. So Jesus said that your words are so important and they carry so much power that you will actually be judged by them. You would be judged by your words. Matthew 12 and 36, he goes, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words you will be justified or by your words you will be condemned. Right there out of Jesus' mouth, saying your words are that powerful, they have the power to condemn you, or they have the power to justify you. So if you're speaking life over yourself, if you're speaking the word of God, guess what? You're speaking life. But if you're speaking the ways of the world, you're speaking death. And it says that every idle word, men will have to give an account thereof. You know what an idle word is? It means barren. That means it has no life in it. 
That's what the idle, word idle means. It means barren, no life. So a person who's speaking life with no words, or, or speaking words with no life, they're going to have to give an account to Jesus why they took that power of the tongue and didn't use it for his kingdom. He said, you spoke 5,253 billion words, and only one of those exalted me. What's the deal? I gave you that tongue for a reason, to produce life or death, and all you did was produce left, death in your life. Nothing that we do, guys, nothing that we do, church, falls on deaf ears. God hears everything. He knows everything. And we have to give account for everything we've done in our lives to him. That's why it's so important that we leave this gospel to the fullest, to glorify him. So James, he gives us a really good snapshot of what he feels about the tongue. Now look at this. In James 3, 5 through 7, Even so, the tongue is a little member, just a little bitty thing, and it boasts great things. It can do great things. A little bitty tongue. Like, and he was comparing it to the rudder of a ship. And the, when you read the full, uh, full the verse, it says that the tongue, just like the rudder of a ship, is very small. But the captain can steer that big old ship with that little bitty rudder. That little bitty rudder. Okay? Same thing with our tongue. This is what he's talking about right here. And he goes, see how great a forest a little fire kindles. He says, and the tongue is a fire. Your tongue is a world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. He's saying your tongue is so powerful, you can have hell on earth because of your tongue, because of your mouth, because of your confessions. You can make hell in your life, is what he's saying. Now, if that is true for that, don't you think it's also true for the opposite? That you can create life? By speaking words of life, because God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will also reap. Look at the next verse here. For every kind of beast and bird and reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. Every animal, we've tamed them all, all of them. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. So he's saying if you're not keeping your senses in check, and you give a little sense over here to the enemy, he'll take all of them from you. Sin must always be met with a fierce, a fierce opposition. When sin comes knocking on your door, you, got, you must rebuke it immediately. You must be ready to fight to keep that sin out of your life. But if you don't, it'll consume you. And eventually you burn up everything, everything in your life. It's full of deadly poison if it's not, if it's not governed by the Spirit of God. Okay, so look at this next verse here. In Proverbs 10, 19, it says that in the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrips, his strains his lips is wise. Didn't I just tell you that earlier? A person who speaks a lot just to talk, chances are, according to the scripture, sin is in his conversation. Why? Because that person says, blah, 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 to the cows come home. He's speaking a whole lot of words that have a whole lot of life, have no life in them. And what is that called? What is that called? Idle words. Idle words. People who talk a lot speak a lot of idle words, a lot of words that have no life in them. But he says the person who restrains his lips is wise. Mm, imagine that. A lot of wise people in here. Lots of wise people. Nobody says anything. <laughs> Except for the person, amen. <laughs> so God, let me give you... Tell you a good example of this. The person who restrains his lips is wise, right? Okay, and we know that your tongue can get you in trouble. So what he's saying here is your tongue has the power to produce life or the power to produce death, right? It also has the power to ruin God's blessings in your lives. Now I'm going to tell you an awesome story about Zacharias. Who was born from Zacharias Church? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Remember, John the Baptist came from Zechariah. Now, Zechariah was a priest. He was serving God, okay? And when his wife, Elizabeth, became pregnant, well, before, he came, before she came pregnant, an angel, the angel Gabriel, came to Zechariah and said, look, this is what's going to happen. Your wife, y'all, y'all are old, yeah, you're really, really old, and your wife is barren, and have never been able to have kids, but I'm gonna, your wife's going to get pregnant, okay? And you're going to raise up John the Baptist for me, and he's going to be great. He's going to be the greatest prophet in all the world. John the Baptist, this is what I'm going to give you. And the man who was walking with God, Zacharias, you think he'd be like, amen, Lord, just, just as you said it. What did he say? He says, how is this going to happen? 
How is this even possible? Look at how old I am. This is an angel from heaven right in front of Zachariah saying, hey, you know what? It's going to be all right. Here we go. You're going to get pregnant. You're going to have John the Baptist. Instead of believing what the angel said, he was in complete and total unbelief towards God and unbelief towards the angel. And so because of that, the angel shut up Zacharias' mouth where he could not talk anymore. Because of the unbelief that is in his heart, the Bible says that whatever is in your heart will come out of your mouth, right? So he knows that if he did not shut up Zacharias, Zacharias would have spoke so much unbelief that the woman never would have got pregnant. Never would have got unpregnant. Why? Because his words have power. So the angel shut him up. Okay? Look, let me just show you. The angel answered him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. And I'm looking at Luke 119. And I was sent to you, I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And now you will be silent and unable to speak that, uh, until that day these things happen, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their season. Zacharias' words were so powerful that the angel had to shut him up to keep him from ruining the promise of God. An angel from heaven Sends, uh, uh, comes down directly from the courts of heaven, says, hey, I'm Gabriel, I'm the angel, I have all power and authority because God gave it to me, and I'm telling you right now that God is going to cause you to have a child. And instead of believing the angel from, that came straight down from heaven, he had so much unbelief in his heart that the angel had to shut him up so he would not ruin or stop the promise of God coming to pass. Because the angel had not put, uh, 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 shut him up. The angel had not shut him up. Guess what would have happened? Either she would have never got pregnant or somewhere along the lines of the pregnancy, the baby would have been lost. Why? Because unbelief in the form of words comes out, has power, and so does faith. You can have faith for the negative. You can have faith for the positive. But your words are that powerful. So don't ever let anybody tell you, oh, they're just words. They don't hurt anybody. Like the sticks and stones break bones, but words will never hurt me. That is a flat-out lie. Words will destroy you. Or they can lift you up. Or they can build life. I'm serious, guys. That, that's how big of a deal this is, that the angel had to stop him from talking because he did not get his voice back until after the baby was born, until after they named him. Then he got his voice back, and then he glorified God. So, he, so you know, at any point in time, he could have ruined the miracle working power of God. Now look at us and how we pray so, Lord, I believe for this, I believe for that, amen, and it's done. At the moment you prayed, your prayer was answered. And what you're supposed to do at that point is supposed to glorify God and praise God. Lord, I thank you. Even though it hasn't manifested yet, I thank you that it's done. And a, a, a two weeks go by, you haven't seen the promise come. Three weeks go by, you haven't seen the promise come. And it's like, oh, well, maybe I didn't pray right. Oh, well, maybe God didn't hear me. Or maybe I'm worthy. And what happens? You start speaking unbelief. And what are you doing at that point? You're ruining the promises of God. You're selling yourself short because... For all you know, it had been one more week and it would have came to pass. But since you fell into unbelief, you lose it. Do you see how important it is to make sure that your senses are not snared by the enemy? Because the enemy will fill your heart, your mind, and your soul with unbelief so the promises of God will not come to pass in your life. That's why you cannot set wicked things before your eyes because you end up becoming them. You end up speaking it forward. You can't be a Christian and not have spiritual discernment in your life. You have to have the control over your appetite. It cannot be your God. Because if these things rule and govern in your life, they're going to ruin the promises of God in your life. The whole point of the enemy's game plan is to get you to speak unbelief instead of speaking life. And he will use all your senses to do that. He will pervert all your senses so you never speak life. He wants you in unbelief. Because this is how this gospel works. This is a gospel of faith. It works off of faith. And you must have faith to get anything from God. But how blessed, are me that er how blessed are we that everything that God could give us, He has already given it. And all we have to do is pull from God's piggy bank whatever it is we need because we have full access to it. And the only way to access God's vault of provision is with the key of faith. The unbelief key does not open God's vault of heaven. Only faith does. And the devil knows that. That's why he tries to get you to confess unbelief all the time. And the angel said, because you did not believe my words, I'm going to have to shut your mouth so you don't ruin the promises of God. That's powerful, isn't that powerful? Now let's go on to the next category, touch. How can your hands get you in trouble? That's easy. My feet get me in trouble if I'm swift to run to, to you know, messed up stuff. 
or my hands too if I'm slapping people around and not in a good way, right? So for me, in my past, my hands got me in trouble a lot. So, you know, I was, I was a little bit of a violent person. <laughs> you would never guess that now, right? Because I'm just so happy and full of, full of love. I'll take hugs if you want to come up and hug me right now, you know? That's who I am now because God transformed my heart, you know? <laughs> so look at Romans 6.13. He says, Neither yield your members, these are my members, your feet, your toes, your eyes, your nose, your ears, these are all members of your body. So neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Don't yield your eyes, don't yield your tongue, don't yield your nose, don't yield your appetite to sin. But yield yourselves to God and those that are alive from the dead those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So if you're saved and you're full of life and you're not a walking dead person, you're supposed to use your body of Christ for this gospel. You're supposed to yield it to Jesus. So whatever Jesus wants to do with you, you have to give yourself to him so he can do it. That's what it means. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Why? Because I've yielded myself completely and totally to Jesus. He can use my fingers, my hands, my eyes, my nose, my ears, my stomach, my appetite, my everything. All for him. Whatever he wants to do with it, it's his. This is what he's talking about here. To yield your members for instruments of righteousness and not of sin. So we're not supposed to use any portion of our body for an unrighteous act. Nothing at all. And I'm going to show you a good scripture that talks about that. Look at Proverbs 6 and 16. These six things does the Lord hate. Okay, these six things, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, so pride, a lying tongue, so deceit, and hands that shed innocent blood. Because we're talking about our physical touch here. So how can we use our hands to offend God to sin? You can have an abortion. You can murder a person. You can pummel a person to the ground. There's a lot of evil that men do with their hands. As a matter of fact, most evil is done with men's hands who create wicked devices, who do evil things. This is one of the biggest um, components of our body that we actually interact with the world is with our hands. And he goes, And a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that are swift running into mischief, a false witness that speaks lies, and he that sows discord among the brethren. These things are an abomination to God. And I just want to tell you about this last one real quick. In verse 19, he that sows discord among the brethren. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about the news, the news media. People who spread propaganda. People who purposely say things to cause fights, to cause strife, to get people to fight amongst each other. And you, can't, you being a Christian can't say, hey, well, that's what I heard. No, you should not be repeating stuff like that. As Christians, we're not supposed to re regurgitate the garbage of the world Oh, I heard so-and-so did this. I heard so-and-so did that. Because that's gossip, number one. But number two, you're causing people's hearts to be in strife against that other person. They don't even know. You can't do that as a Christian. Because God says it's an abomination. The only things that should be leaving in your mouth are things that edify, things that praise, things that worship God, things that lift people up, things that, that repair people, that help people. That's the only thing you should be speaking from your mouth. Is that. Is life. Unless you're cursing the devil at the root and the cancer or whatever it may be, then you know that's warfare, but you're still speaking life. You get what I'm saying? Why, why do you think Jesus judges us for idle words? Everything that doesn't speak life. And, and there's a lot of people that don't understand that. Go, you guys have been in many churches here before. Y'all can go to any church and you can hear unbelief in people. You can hear them speaking death and not speaking life. I Every single church that I've been through here in the famous town of Bandera, I've heard Preachers and the congregation speak death over and over and over again. And it's so grieving, so grieving, and it's so dangerous. But it's, what's even more upsetting is that the pastors of the church, if they're not directly involved in speaking unbelief, they're allowing it to happen in their congregation. That, 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 that can't fly, man. How can a pastor be a pastor of a church if he's not properly instructing the sheep and edifying them and lifting them up and, and reprimanding them when they're not doing something right according to the Spirit of God? Some people don't like that. Maybe they're afraid they're going to lose their tithes. Well, you know what? It's better to be right with God and to be wrong with man than the other way around. Because that's not going to be good for that minister when he goes up to the, to the throne of Jesus and has to give an account. Why do you think I take my job so, so serious and I always open the door for you guys to come and, and edify me 
and helping me sharpen. It's important to me that I'm teaching right and I'm teaching everything in truth. So what's another example of that touch of getting you in trouble? You all remember the golden calf incident with Moses? Moses went up to the mountain to go seek God. Aaron was down there, his brother. He didn't come down for a while. And so the people said, hey, you know, Moses is gone. He's not coming down. Uh, we need something to worship. And then Aaron, who's supposed to be a man of God, makes them an idol, makes them a golden calf. And they all worship the golden calf. And then when Moses comes down, well, you think he was happy? He's pretty mad. He was pretty mad. He was mad to the point where he says, all right, that's it. You've got to choose a side. Whoever's on my side and won't follow God, step over here. Whoever doesn't want to follow God, do what I say, go on this side. The people that went on that side, guess what? He killed them. He had the Levites destroy them. Why? Because they were a cancer. And if God would have allowed those people to live, they would have ruined what God was trying to do to bring the Messiah. There was a lot, a lot of people get mad. Well, if God's God and he's so great and so this and that, why did all these people die, this and that? Because if God had not taken those people out, there would be no salvation today. There would be no Jesus. You would have no internal inheritance in heaven. God, he had to do what he had to do to make sure you had salvation today, to make sure the world could be saved. And those people that were all killed, they were killed by their own devices, by their own demise. They completely and totally rejected God, meaning there was no hope for them. God had mercy. God extended, great, God extended great mercy to the people who were lost in the forest for 40 years. He gave them great mercy. 40 years of mercy. 40 years of patience waiting for them to turn around, and they never did. And so the ones who didn't died. Why? Because they rejected God. They rejected Him. So here's the deal. We're coming to the end of the, today's teaching. Y'all have seen how the five senses are capable of getting into a lot of trouble, or you're capable of glorifying God with them. So how do you protect your senses? How do you protect these organs? How do you get the members of your body into alignment with God's will? And what I'm going to tell you, these next two scriptures here are the most important ones. Okay, They're the icing on the cake for this teaching today. And you must implement them because they will make the difference in your life of whether or not you are given into the flesh or whether you're given into the Spirit of God. So what do we need to protect them? So first thing is you've got to reprogram your soul. You must reprogram your soul. You've got to get the right knowledge in there and in your heart. Look at Ephesians 4.22. He's, he's instructing us. He says, He says, Put off concerning the former conversation the old man. The old man is who you were before Jesus. That's the person of the world. He says, and you remember what conversation means? Conversation means behavior. So he's saying, get rid of your old behavior that belongs to the old, unrenewed man who is now dead because you're born again in Christ. So get rid of that old stuff. Your old habits, your old bad habits are gone because they are corrupt and they are led and according to deceitful lust. They are made for the desires of the world. And you don't do that anymore is what he's saying. So you've got to get rid of them. He says, instead, I want you to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So they make sure your mind is renewed with the things of God. You're no longer putting garbage in front of yourself anymore. You're putting the things of God in front of you because what you're doing is you're renewing. If you read the Bible every day and you spend time with the Word every day and you listen to the Word every day, you speak the Word every day, what you're doing, church, is you're renewing yourself to that truth. But if you're hanging out with the world, watching worldly things, speaking worldly things, you're renewing yourself to that truth. And you will end up becoming whatever it is you engage in the most. And if you engage in the world the most, you become the world. And you sound like the world and you look like the world. You only have the title of the Christian, but you don't look like one. You don't sound like one. You don't live like one. What he's trying to do is to make sure people don't fall into that category. So we must be renewed in the spirit of our minds. And we must put on the new man, which is the reborn spirit, the reborn person in Christ. We must put on the new man, which is created after God in his righteousness and his holiness. So in other words, we've got to start acting like Jesus. We've got, to, we've got to start doing what Jesus did. And the only way you can reprogram yourself to do that is by getting a hold of this gospel and living it. And doing it, you've got to be a doer of the word. You can't be stagnant. You can't sit there and not do anything. You've got to get a hold of this gospel, and you've got to do it. And here's the second thing we have to do. And this portion is directly related to warfare. You must reject and cast down the temptations of the flesh. Whenever a temptation comes, whenever the desire of the enemy comes, if you entertain it for a second and let it sit there, it eventually turns into a full-blown desire and you end up acting on that desire. 
And I'll give you the perfect example of this. Someone told me this morning that we almost didn't come to church. Who do you think put that desire there? The devil said, oh, you don't have to go to church. But what happened? You cast it down. You rejected it. And you resisted it. And what happened? You came to church. Do you see how that works? Now, where's the scripture for that? 2 Corinthians 10.3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty. They are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Strongholds is wrong thinking. We cast down every imagination, cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So when the devil told you don't go to church today, that's something that exalts itself against the knowledge of God because we know that the Bible says that we must not forsake the assembling together. We must come together as the body of Christ. We must do God's will. We must seek God. But the enemy is telling you not to seek God. So what's happening is the enemy is exalting himself against God, telling you don't do that. But the Spirit of God is saying, yes, you will do that. And this is how you do it. You had to take, a, you had to take authority over that thought. You had to get that thought captive and say, you know what? I am not going to miss church. I reject that thought in the name of Jesus. And I cast it down. That's how you win that battle. That's how you take that potential big issue and destroy it before it becomes an issue. So how could something, in, the, in, that, in that example, how could that be something that could turn to something detrimental? Because if you miss church just one time, you're more likely to miss it again and again and again and again. And guess what happens? Now you have a spirit on you of laziness. A, a, a spirit of slothness, a spirit that does not seek after God. And what happens is you start pulling away from God. Oh, I'm too tired. Oh, I'm too busy. Oh, this and that excuse. Oh, my whatever, whatever under the sun. There's no excuse good enough to not chase after God. And it all starts with just one little bitty thing, just a little bitty hiccup. The devil says, hey, it's okay. You can miss church that one time. No big deal. Pastor's forgiving and merciful and loving. He's all right. It'll be okay. And then it turns into a habit. And that habit of sin, the habitual sin, consumes you to the point where you start running away from God and you're no longer chasing Him. So we must, like it says in verse 5, we must cast down those imaginations, cast down those thoughts. Everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, we must cast it down. We must take it captive. And we must command every thought to be obedient to Jesus. That is how you destroy. That is where the battlefield is at, guys. It's in your mind. And if you can destroy it there, it'll never take residence or root in your flesh. And you must apply these two scriptures to all your five senses. To all your five senses. And that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to apply these to all our five senses. So here we go. Those two scriptures is what it looks like. And this is an example that you can use with anything in the Word of God. Our eyes. Lord, we bring into captivity every image to the obedience of Christ. And I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. And that's based on Psalm 101. And what did we do? We took the truth and the past two scriptures, the two scriptures we had before, about casting down those vain imaginations and bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. This is what that looks like when you do that. This is what that looks like. Lord, I bring into captivity every image to the obedience of Christ, and I will set no wicked things before my eyes, so saith the Lord. Amen. And what about our ears? Lord, I bring into captivity every sound and every doctrine to the obedience of Christ. And I will study to show myself approved. That's based on 2 Timothy 2.15. We're bringing the words and the things that we hear captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Meaning this, if it's not from God, it's out of here. If it's not from Jesus, it's got to go. What about your nose? Lord, I bring into captivity my discernment to the obedience of Jesus Christ. And I will possess my vessel in sanctification and honor. The vessel is your body, specifically the body of Christ, because you have the Spirit of God in you. So your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. That's the vessel he's talking about. Now that is based on 1 Corinthians 2.14 and Thessalonians 4.4, which the vessel that we have in Thessalonians says we must make sure that our body is something that we can glorify God with. Esau didn't do that. He chased after his appetite. He didn't glorify God in his body. Okay, And that's what that's based on. Now what about our mouth? Lord, I bring into captivity every word to the obedience of Christ, and I will let no corrupt communication come out of my mouth. Meaning I will speak nothing evil, Lord. I will only speak life. 
and that's based on Ephesians 4 and 29, and also Proverbs, death and life from the power of tongue. Do you see how Scripture is used with other Scripture for the basis of your warfare? And your victory is in all this. And what about touch? Lord, I bring you to captivity every member of my body to the obedience of Christ, and I will not yield or give any member of my body to sin. And that was based on Romans 6.13. Do you see how we made Scripture come alive with the Word of God? We took the two principles that it set up there. You cast down every vain imagination. You reject it. And you reprogram your soul with the truth. You see, I would not have been able to say these things, these examples here, if I hadn't first renewed my mind. In order for this to, have to be written on my snow, on my soul, on my heart, in order for me to produce this on command when the situation arises, I must have, have it first written on my heart, which means I must expose it. Like all this stuff will fly out of my mouth immediately, automatic. I don't have to go and look it up. It's written on my heart. I know it. And the only way you can know the Word of God is by reading the Word of God, doing the Word of God, reprogramming your mind. And once your mind is reprogrammed, whenever the temptation comes, you'll know immediately what to say. Why? Because it's written on your heart. And that's how you win battles. That's how you put the devil in his place. That's how you give no stronghold to the devil. You give no place to the devil. Why? Because you immediately meet him with the Word of God. And the Word of God said, he has lost, and you are the winner. You are victorious. You have victory in the name of Jesus. Amen.